Wander Wealthy Podcast, Episode 73. What's up, my friends? Welcome back to another episode of the Wander Wealthy Podcast. My name is Tess Wicks. I'm your host. And yes, we are doing one last solo show. Pretty much just going to be doing a whole September of solo shows. Next week, which is the last week of September, we will have a guest back and then we'll be doing guests all throughout October for the most part. But you get me for one last week, just me. Today I really wanted to focus on getting away from talking kind of personal development and get into more personal development as it relates specifically to finances because we're going to be talking about setting financial goals and I want to give you some really tangible tips to walk away with from this show so you can go and start implementing it into your life. So last week I shared kind of how I'm like getting my life back together, so to speak. Starting in October, finally, when I'm done with all this crazy travel, I'm done, you know, missing a bunch of interviews. I can actually have a normal interview schedule. So again, interviews are coming back. And when that does come about, then I will be implementing the things I shared last week of all the different ways I'm getting my life back together. But one of those things was doing kind of a full financial review. Once a quarter, I always like to sit down and review my finances in more of like a big picture and then getting into the nitty gritty details of just what's happening. Make sure I'm on pace with what goals I had set previously in the year and so on and so forth. So I always recommend to do that once a quarter. And then the other thing I shared is that I personally am going to get back on a budget because I don't always budget, but I do think it's really important to make sure that you almost bring things back together again when you feel like maybe you've been overspending a little bit or your financial situation has changed. And that's the perfect time to commit again to a budget, something a little bit more strict with a little bit more boundaries and guidelines to make sure that you're making the proper financial decisions. So I'll be going back on a budget for two to three months just to make sure that my spending is in line with where my finances currently are. And yeah, because things had changed for me so much since moving to Italy, it'll be kind of an eye-opening experience to see how my money management has ebbed and flowed and how it will continue into the future. Now with that, I think it's also a good time to, when you're doing your big kind of financial overhaul, deep dive, big picture looking, all that stuff, I think it's also important to kind of reassess your financial goals. However, I know that a lot of people don't even maybe know what their financial goals are. So I wanted to dive into a little bit of a goal setting guide, so to speak, and just share with you some examples of financial goals and then give you some ideas of where you would actually put your money for these specific goals, maybe some recommendations on where you might want to put your money, what kind of strategy you might want to follow. And then from there, give you a very clear idea of what goals to set for yourself where how to get started how to just like once you're done with this listening to this show you can go okay these are my three goals this is what I'm going to commit to let's go so let's just dive on in shall we if you ever sign up for the money program or if you are a current member or you've gone through my coaching you'll know that I really like to look at finances in three different time frames you have your long-term goals which I say and it's changed over the years but I've come to the conclusion that it is a goal that is over nine or ten years out from today's date so that would be your long-term goal it has to be beyond nine slash ten years and I'll explain why in a little bit Then you have your medium term goals. These are things you want to be able to achieve from today's date, two to three on the minimum up to nine or 10. So again, I have a reason for that. I'll explain that in a second. And then you have your short term goals, which you want to achieve between zero days from now and two to three years from now. So the reason that I split these up into these time frames is first of all, because They require kind of different saving strategies and vehicles in which you would put your money into. So that is the one main reason. For instance, if you have a short-term goal that you want to achieve within the year, it's best to keep that in the most risk-averse savings vehicle. And what that means is just the lowest 
risk possible that you could put your money into. And for most people, although some might argue it's under your mattress, I would say it's in a high yield savings account. And high yield or not, it doesn't really matter. You just want your money to be safe and FDIC insured, which means in a bank account, specifically in a savings account, because that adds a little bit of a barrier and you could potentially get a little bit more of an interest rate than you would in a checking account. Now in that savings account, why do you want it there? Because you need to be able to access this money in a pretty short amount of time. So if you were to instead put it into an investment account, then there is a possibility, even if it's a well diversified for your risk situation and the timeline you're looking at, And again, we'll talk about that in a second too. But if it's like a very well diversified account where more of the money is in fixed income, aka bonds rather than stocks, you're still at risk of losing that money. And since you need it, you know, in the next year or even two or three, you might be better off keeping that in a savings account where it's fully insured. So you're not at risk of losing that money unless of course you spend it. So that's the reason why I say, you know, if you have something that you need to be able to spend, you you have like a goal you're trying to reach and you need to be able to access that money within a year or even two to three, keep it in a savings account. Now, the other reason I say this, and I especially am very restrictive with it being a year at least, is that if you're investing money that you need to access before the year is up, then when you pull money out, assuming you made money on your investments, you would be paying short-term capital gains tax instead of long-term capital gains tax. So this is just a very specific nuance, but you pay short-term capital gains when you take your money out within a year. If you wait a year and your money hasn't been invested for over a year, then any money you made on that investment, you would pay long-term capital gains. And the difference between short-term and long-term is that long-term you pay significantly less, a a lower tax rate than you do with short-term capital gains taxes. So that's just one thing to note. Um, It's not like a huge deal if you don't have much invested and you're not making a ton of money on these investments, but it's still something and another reason why if you did want to be saving in some vehicle and you're going to need that money within the year, you would obviously want to keep it in a savings account or some other sort of FDIC insured low risk savings vehicle. You know, that could be like a certificate of deposit or a money market account. But honestly, I prefer savings accounts. They're just more simple. They tend to give you better benefits than the other two, in my opinion. So short term goals, zero to two to three years. That is the rationale behind that. Then we move on to medium term goals. So I say two to three years, but it can be anywhere from above one year to I say nine or 10 years. Now, the reason here is because your medium term goals are a little interesting. You know, if they're on the shorter end of the spectrum, meaning you want to, let's say, get married in five years, then that would be a decision where you'd have to make between whether you want to put your money away in a savings account or put it into more of a higher return type of account, which you can't guarantee higher returns, but you have the possibility of that with some sort of like investment account. So if you're getting married in five years, you kind of have to make that decision. Obviously, you if you did go with investing that money, you would pick investment, your asset allocation, to be invested in a very appropriate, balanced risk portfolio. Meaning you would probably wouldn't put all of that money into stocks. You would want to well balance it given the fact that you're going to need that money within five years. So it'd probably be mostly in fixed income with a little bit in stocks. So you have opportunity for growth, but you need that money to still be secure. Now, still five years is still pretty soon, but it's also pretty far away. So that is really a decision you have to make. You can kind of decide, okay, should some of this stay in a bank account, like a savings account that's designated for this wedding, but then some of it can be given the opportunity to grow. You know, it's up to you. That's just something that I threw out there as a medium term 
like savings vehicle option is whether you want to put it in investments or put it in a bank account. Once we get to the nine or 10 year mark, you might be putting more of it into investments, but still knowing that you're going to more carefully have that money invested in a proper asset allocation. And when I say asset allocation, it's just where is that money allocated into stocks or bonds? Like what percentage goes where? And usually you want to go for a lower risk allocation because you're going to need that money in nine or 10 years, you're going to go for something that is more heavily weighted towards bonds, aka fixed income, rather than stocks, aka equity. Now again, it kind of depends on your own ability and appetite for risk. It depends on the timeline that you need that money. Um, and it just depends on whether you would rather keep it in a savings account or not. But these goals that you have that you want to achieve within two to three or all the way up to nine or 10 years, those are your options. You have more options than you do in short-term kind of savings vehicles. If you're looking at this and you're going, okay, I'm interested in getting maybe a higher return than I would on my bank account savings, just putting it in a normal savings account, but I have no idea how to like allocate these stocks, then I highly recommend, and again, it's not guaranteed that you're gonna make more than you would on your 1% savings yield savings account, but you have that opportunity with the stock market. So I would highly recommend just signing up for a robo advisor. Again, you have to make your own decision, but this is something that I personally do. I use Betterment and I select specific goals. So I have a goal where I want to, I call it my investment property fund, but you know, I might end up just like using it to buy a car or something. It's, it has a um, goal balance of like $20,000. So I know that I'm going to be able to have that money in the next like seven years is what the timeline on it is. So this money is invested in the stock market through a robo advisor, which mine, the one I use is Betterment. They tend to have the lowest fees that I've seen on the market but more on that in a future episode, I guess. And with Betterment, I can say, okay, I want to be able to have this money by seven years from now. And they go, okay, noted. And then I say, and this is all automated, like through a computer screen. And then I say, you know, this is how comfortable I am with taking on risk. Um, and if you have ever been through my investment 101 training, I have a free email course. So wonderwealthy.com slash invest is how you can get there or you've ever been through the money program, then you would understand kind of the need for understanding what your timeline is when you're investing, but also how much risk you're willing to take on. And you can kind of measure those two up to determine how much you should be putting your money in fixed income versus in equity. So in lower risk assets versus higher risk assets. So Betterment helps you get to that ultimate solution. And that's really awesome because then they just take care of the rest for you. So you set up your investment. You say, okay, I'm going to contribute, let's say $100 a month. And they will take that $100 and they will invest it so that it is properly allocated for the amount of risk you're willing to take on and given the timeline of when you need that money out. And then every year it adjusts because every year you're getting closer to that goal. So every year they adjust the allocation and it automatically adjusts so you don't even have to think about it again. That is why I so highly recommend using a robo-advisor if you want to be a little bit more hands-off with your investments because they do it kind of for you. There's a lot more details on why using robo-advisors could be better or worse. That is, again something for another day but I just am wanting to give you kind of these options of where can you save your money if you're saving for these various goals that have different you know lengths of time when you're going to need to be able to have this money so short term again just to repeat so I'm not losing you here short term is generally a high yield savings account there are some exceptions and I'm going to get to that when I get into examples of what your actual goals might be Medium term could be a savings account, it could be a certificate of deposit, or it could be something like a more conservative investment account. Brokerage account is another name. A broker is someone like Schwab or Fidelity or Vanguard. Brokerage accounts that you personally manage, but you keep it on a conservative level if you're you know comfortable with investing on your own. Or you could do a robo-advisor, which basically acts as a brokerage account, but they have 
computers that analyze this and manage it for you because, you know, not all of us are super privy in the investment space. So short term savings accounts, medium term, you can either go savings or you can go these brokerage accounts. Let's move on to long term. And now I'm going to explain why the top length of time for medium term goals is nine slash 10 years and why the beginning of long-term goals is nine slash 10 years and over. And that actually gets down to this very common rule of thumb called the rule of 72. And the rule of 72 basically just says you take the number 72 and divide it by the expected rate of return that you believe you're going to get on your investments or your savings, but more likely if it's long-term stuff, we're talking investments now. And if you take 72 and you divide it by eight, which is generally the historic average annual rate of return. Now, what that means is some years you'll make 20% return on your investment and other years you'll make negative 20%. But eventually with the ebbs and flows, if you look at the history of the stock market and what it has historically returned year over year, you'll see that it's around 8%. Now, There are some periods of time that have been significantly higher than that, but for conservative reasons, I like to work when I'm talking with my clients and we're trying to estimate, you know, how much should you be saving for X, Y, Z? We'll look at a between a six and 8% average rate of return. Now, in this regard, we did the rule of 72 and I did a seven to 8% because, you know, I'm very optimistic about the ability of the stock market and my own investment knowledge and the way that I teach investing, on average, you're going to look at a 7 to 8% return. So given that, if you look at the rule of 72, when you take 72 and you divide it by that return that you're expecting to get, which in our case could be 7 to 8%, then what it equals is the amount of years it's going to take for your money to double. Here, I have nine or 10 years because nine would be with an 8% return and 10 years would be with a 7% return, 10.2 technically. You can expect that if you invested $10,000 today and you follow a index investing strategy where this $10,000 is properly weighted for your risk and your risk appetite and the length of time, which for you would be long-term. If we're looking long-term, then this is going to be your average generally. Then you can expect that 10 years from now, if we're looking at a 7% annual return on average, 10 years from now, your $10,000 should double in money. And that's just assuming a one-time investment of $10,000. So it will be $20,000 10 years from now. And then 10 years from that, it could be $40,000. And then 10 years from that, it could be $80,000. And that is the power of compound interest. It's pretty awesome. But of course, you'll also be investing on top of that year over year. And that's where you can really see that massive wealth grow. Now, I like to use this as kind of a baseline for long-term investing because, you know, having something 10 years out means you can feel pretty com- confident and comfortable with putting it in the stock market as opposed to keeping it all in savings. And you can get a little bit more creative with how it's weighted, whether you should keep the money more in fixed income or more in stocks. And of course, if you want help with that, you can use something like a Betterment or a different robo-advisor. There's plenty of them out there and they can help you. Or you can do your own research or you can work with, of course, a financial advisor or an investment advisor. You just want to make sure you check the fees and their investment strategy because that's where we could get into trouble and you can end up losing money instead of really, I mean, you might make money, but you'll make a lot less than you expected. Oh, fees. I need to do a whole podcast on that another day. But your invest, your when you're looking at long term, I mean, you're really looking at long term planning. So, ten years is even kind of cutting it close. But I like that ten year mark just because you would know that if you could invest your money, and nothing crazy happens over the course of the ten years. Although maybe that would be good because sometimes when things are bad, that's a good time to buy, and then you recover. It just depends on how long it takes the stock market to recover. Then at the end of the 10 years, you could see, you know, a pretty good earnings of money and that's far enough out for any goal that you're having that you could feel confident um, being able to afford that goal by then. However, 
the long-term goals I have, as an example, tend to be more than 10-year goals, unless you are up there um, in age, and then you would be closer to a lot of these goals. So let's get into that then, because now we've covered kind of the vehicles that you would use for these various goals, and it'll make more and more sense when we talk more specifically about what those goals are. But I just wanted to be very clear about with that long-term strategy, you'll likely be invested and you'll just be, it'll just be the nuance between investing in a tax advantage account, which is generally a retirement account, or maybe a 529 account if you're saving for education, or a non-tax advantaged account, which is just your standard brokerage account or investing through a robo advisor in a not tax advantaged account as well. Okay, so now I want to get into the examples of what types of goals we're talking about here or getting a little bit more specific about what is a long-term goal versus a medium-term goal. So you have the idea in mind and I'm most of my audience is between the ages of 18 years old and 35 sometimes to 45 years old. So with that in mind, if you're in that age range, then this applies to you. However, if you're much older, then you might be obviously closer to retirement than even 10 years away. So technically, retirement wouldn't even be a long-term goal, and you would want to start looking elsewhere. But I typically create content for millennials um, or just women in their 20s and 30s. And so that's who I'm talking about when I'm explaining what some of these goals are. So let's start with the long term because I think it's the most the thing that we're most knowledge about knowledgeable about. So obviously your retirement is a long term goal, um, unless you're planning on early retirement, which again is a whole nother podcast. That's for those who are you know really aiming for financial independence and it tends not to be my audience, but I am personally interested in that as well. So that could be you know content for another day. But if you're planning on a standard retirement where you would retire around the ages of 65 to 70, then this would be a goal for you that you're going to achieve in the next 40 years. We'll just put that as an average 40, 30 to 40 years, but probably more on the 40 years end. So obviously that's somewhere you would put that money in a tax advantaged account. You might have a 401k, you might have an IRA or a Roth IRA, you might be in Canada and have, oh gosh, now I just blanked on it, TFSA, is that right? Um, But you have your own retirement accounts that mimic a lot of the US retirement accounts. But regardless of that, those accounts, the money in those accounts needs to be invested. And a lot of people, when people, we talk about investing and I just talked about this in the money program. I did a Facebook live about getting really clear on the fact that an IRA is not an investment. It is a vehicle that gives you certain tax advantagement advantages that you get to invest through, but it is not an investment. If you have an IRA or a Roth IRA set up, you need to go into that bad boy and make sure that the monies you're putting into it are actually invested in the stock market. Otherwise, It's just acting like a really, really bad savings account. And we don't need that. We don't want that. We don't need that. So make sure your money is actually invested. Same with your 401k or other employer-sponsored retirement plans. Sometimes, and I know this was the case a long time ago, I don't know if it's necessarily the default anymore, but I had an aunt who thought she was investing in her retirement for years, and she was. She was putting her money away, but she didn't go in and do anything with it. So it was actually just sitting in some really like low-yield, very, very, very risk-safe bonds. And that was not good for her over the long run because she was pretty far from retirement you know, for most of her employment, and now it, it hasn't grown as much as it could have. So your retirement accounts are obviously one thing that you would have a long-term goal. Again, this is another topic for another day, so I won't dive into it any more than that. Some other examples might be a 529 plan or any other type of college savings that you want to set aside for yourself, but then it wouldn't be a long-term goal, but more likely your children. So the 529 plans specifically are tax advantage. Other examples would be to buy a second home or even a first if you're nine to 10 years away from that. Buying an investment property or, you know, starting to invest for 
future charity or your children's future inheritance. So these are all kind of examples of what those long-term goals are. Obviously, if you feel like you're nine to 10 years out from any other specific goal, then that would be a long-term goal too. However, you're in the nine to 10 to 20 year range versus the 20 to 40 plus range, you're gonna be investing a little bit differently. Obviously, the allocation of your fixed income versus your equities will be different. But for the most part, you're probably looking more towards an investment rather than putting it in a savings bank account. Okay, so moving on to the medium term, this is things you want to achieve and be able to pay for within two slash three all the way up to nine slash 10 years. These could be so many things. Like just think about what do I wanna do three years out from now? But I have a list of an example. Maybe you want to get married in five years or seven years or whatever. Maybe you're driving around a car right now, but you want to start saving for a new to you used car because I don't recommend buying new, brand new. So new to you used car, which, you know, you still have a good 10 years left on your current car, but just in case within the three to 10 year range, your current car doesn't do what you thought it was going to do. You can start saving into some sort of low risk investment account or high yield savings account. Maybe you want to save for buying your first home or your second, who knows, or renovations on that property, but you have a a seven year goal or whatnot. Maybe you want to buy an investment property, pay for higher education. You're planning some really big travel. Maybe you have an idea for a family reunion four years down the road. Maybe you're planning for a career change where you might be unemployed for a bit or who knows, or you're planning on entrepreneurship and starting your own business, but you're still a handful of years out from that. These are all things that would fall in that medium term goal. Now, another thing that would fall there is being debt free. And this may not necessarily mean being mortgage debt free, but if you're still paying off college, paying off a car, paying off credit card debt or a personal loan, this is a really, really great medium term goal that would not obviously fall in the realm of saving in a savings account or investing. But I don't want to discount this from being a medium term goal. Do make sure you remember that because it's really important to have as a goal if you do have debt. Now the short term goals. So these break up into two sections. I have ongoing short-term goals where you constantly need that money available for you. And then I have obviously just like this is a one-year or a two-year goal. So the first bucket is ongoing goals. And my absolute favorite, the most important, the thing you have to have is your emergency savings fund or your oh shit account or your fuck off fund, whatever you want to call it. This is very important to have. So we've talked plenty about how much you really need to have in your emergency savings fund, but just know it's really wise to have an emergency savings fund in, you guessed it, a savings account. But you you need this savings account forever and ever more because you always want to have an emergency savings fund available to you. So you're going to need to be able to access it within the year, obviously, pretty much at any given time. That's a really good savings goal to have. Another one would be, and these are more kind of you can pick and choose, but I personally like to have a gifts account, like a weddings and gifts account, be able to attend other people's weddings, buy people holiday gifts. And this is an ongoing goal as well because it's going to happen every single year. The amount might change, but for the most part, I always have this account open. I'm always contributing to it because every six months I'm pulling out of it because usually in the summertime I'm going to weddings and usually in the wintertime I'm going to traveling for holidays and buying people gifts. The third ongoing account is non-monthly expenses account. I used to call this semi-annual, but I thought that was too specific. This is basically just expenses you pay every year, but you kind of forget about because you only pay them once or twice or four times a year. This could be things like certifications that you have to keep up with, membership dues, whether you pay them once a year or four times a year, insurance like car insurance that you pay every six months, unless you pay on monthly. I like to pay every six months. And a lot of times I like this account because I can save into it throughout the year. And then when I pay for an annual, let's say, gym membership, I can actually get a discount. So sometimes it is wise to, you know, save up throughout the year and pay in full. And, you know, one year you might have to pay the monthly fee while you're saving up 
for the annual fee. So you're kind of like saving both at a time. But then the next year, it'll all work itself out. Plus, if you can pay in full at the end of the year, then you can get a discount, hopefully. So that's always something fun to do. And it's a good ongoing account to have. A travel account, if you tend to travel a lot or you tend to, you could have an entertainment or baseball account. If you go to a ton of baseball games over the summer, you know, whatever your thing is, my thing is travel. Every single year I'm going to go on trips. Every single year I'm going to have a travel account. So this is an ongoing account for me, may not be for you. So you could also just have a one year travel goal because this year at the end of the year, you want to take that one trip that you've been thinking about forever. So set that up too. That's a good short-term savings goal that is not necessarily ongoing. One more ongoing thing, and you know, this is again up to you, and it's similar to the travel account, is more like personal, discretionary, and frivolous spending. And I just, you know, you can call it whatever you want. I also call it like a personal pampering account or a beauty account or a shopping account. It's basically thing, an account where you save money every month because once every other month or once every three months or you know whenever you feel it necessary you like to get a massage or get your hair done or go shopping or do something where it's more frivolous than you're just like day to day I'm buying gas and groceries and like other random small things type of spending so if you follow the anti-budget it'd be like You want to save for this big thing outside of your daily spending number because you want to make sure you have that money and you don't want to have to go way negative with your daily number because it's not gas or groceries. So that's always a good account to have maybe in the future when you start getting your things in order and organized. Now, a couple more and then we'll wrap this up because I know we're getting long, but I do feel like hopefully this is really helpful for you if you are in this kind of planning phase or you can come back to that this at any point in time when you are planning out your finances. So if you are self-employed or you own a business or you even do contracting, like independent contracting on the side or freelance work on the side, you need to have a taxes account set up. And by the way, you don't have to have any of these accounts. I'm just giving you options. I'm going to tell you where you might want to start thinking once we're done with going through all of this list. But if you are self-employed and you are responsible for paying a portion, if not all of your taxes on your own, you need to have a taxes account. This is just a savings account. You can Put money away. I say every time you get paid, you take a percentage of that and put it into this taxes account. Likely, most likely it's in, and preferably it's in a business bank account, but some people choose to not do that. But have money being saved and then every quarter you can pay your quarterly taxes out. Or if you prefer, you can just save up until the end of the year when you have to pay your annual taxes plus the small fee for not paying your quarterly. A couple other accounts, and this is just to reiterate some things that would be in the medium term goals if it was more than a couple years away. But if you want to achieve these things within two slash three years, then you'd have a career change or entrepreneurship goal. You'd have a new car, a house, or a wedding goal. And then, of course, we have the debt payoff again, which, again, is not money that goes into a savings account, but it is still such an applicable goal for you to have in the short term. And if that's where your priorities need to go, if that's where your money needs to go in order to save up for you know something you really want to achieve, then that is where it should go. Okay, so that is like the summary. I hope you took notes. I will be sure to copy this list into the show notes of this episode, which you can find at wanderwealthypodcast.com slash podcast slash episode 73. The last thing I want to talk about is where do you go from here? Now you know all of the the things you could be saving for. Maybe you're feeling a little overwhelmed, like, oh, I have to save for all of this all at once right now. And my recommendation is just to do this. Choose one thing from a long-term one thing from your medium term, and one thing from your short-term goals. If you have the time, sit down and write out long-term and then list everything you could possibly think about wanting to achieve in the long-term. Then do the same for medium-term and then do the same for short-term. But then consider your own financial situation and go, okay, I can do something for my long-term. You know, I can put something away in my 401k just to meet the matching contribution that my employer gives. That would be a really, really great single one to choose. For medium term, kind of think out and think, what is it that I need to achieve? Is it being debt free in three to four years? Or is it, you know, you know you're going to be getting married or you know you're going to need to be paying for higher education? What is that medium term goal that you should be really saving for? And just pick one. And then short term, 
I kind of have two recommendations. One is obviously an emergency savings. If you don't have an emergency savings yet, it needs to be the priority. Two, if you have debt, that also needs to be the priority. Let's pay that bad boy off. And you can even get to the point where you're going now, okay, is retirement worth it or do I need to pay off my debt? Are these medium-term goals worth it or do I need to pay off my debt? But I think it also helps people to know that they're saving for their future. They're building wealth through long-term savings. And then if you have debt, you can maybe skip the medium term until you've conquered that debt. That is just an option, but that is something to focus on, especially if you haven't saved in emergency savings yet and you're also paying off debt. In the short term, you definitely want to make sure you have your emergency savings as a goal. If you're already up to $1,000 or one month's fixed expenses, what's, whichever is higher, then you can move on to really conquering that debt. If you don't have any debt, then you can pick one of the short-term goals. Unless all of your short-term goals don't really overwhelm you, then you can choose, okay, how am I going to set this system up so that I can make sure I'm progressively and proactively saving into each of these goals while also making sure that my one long-term goal is covered and my one medium-term goal is covered. And then when you get into checking up on your finances every single quarter, once a quarter, as we go forward, we'll do this at the new year, we'll do it again in April and then ongoing and ongoing, that's where you can reassess and go, is this short-term goal still important to me? Yes or no? Even if it is, do I want to add a medium-term goal? Do I want to add a long-term goal? Where am I at now? Did I get married? What are our goals as a couple? These are things we need to just continuously do. I think the thing I'm going to leave you with is that when it comes to your finances, you don't need to make any hard and fast and permanent decisions now. I just want you to make a decision and start moving towards that decision start taking action and implementing because especially if you're invested or if you're saving you can always reallocate you don't have to go okay this is going to be for this thing and that's you know how it is forever and ever amen you can choose to change your mind you can move things around and that is really important if you are trying to plan your future and you're feeling a little bit stuck with which decision to make. Look at the list, pick one long-term, pick one medium-term maybe, make sure you have emergency savings and debt payoff covered in the short term, and if those are covered, then you can go back to going, okay, this is my one medium-term, and this is my new short-term that I wanna add, and then build it from there, okay? So that's what I'm gonna leave you with. I hope it was helpful. I'd love to hear more, and of course, you can always feel Welcome and open to joining the conversation even further. We hang out in the Wealthy Wanderers private Facebook community on Facebook. If you're open to joining that and having more conversations about this or anything else in your personal finance life or personal life, whatever, then you can come join us at wanderwealthy.com slash FB. One more thing that I wanted to share is this is the almost start of fall we're almost there and as I am resetting maybe you are resetting too and if you feel like you need a full financial reset you want to discuss these goals but also get into the nitty-gritty of your finances and you need someone to do that with you then I want you to know I have three spots open for the fall for one-on-one -on -one money coaching we work together for three months I do two calls with you per month and we do a full financial review starting with either sometimes it's short term to medium term to long term and sometimes it's long term to medium term to short term but we do a full financial review we set you up we start planning for your financial roadmap what it looks like for you in the future and how you can continue to make better decisions for yourself going forward so if you think you are ready for that if you think that that's something that you need right now if you need accountability if you need guidance if you need encouragement then I encourage you to sign up apply for the money coaching at wanderwealthy.com slash apply of course all of this stuff will be in the show notes I will also link anything in order to get you to the show notes or just get you through the process to join the Facebook group or to apply for money coaching in the description of this episode so whatever podcast player you're on you should be able to go to the episode description and click the links otherwise come to wanderwealthypodcast.com slash podcast slash episode 73 all right that's all I have for you today 
Until next time, I hope you wander wealthy.